Okay, this material is from chapter 3. We're talking about reflexes. If you guys remember, we said when you're born, you have a certain number of reflexes that you can do. You can suck, swallow, that kind of thing. So this is our starting point for everything we're going to learn beyond that. Now, reflexing ha reflex has a couple things you need to know. Eliciting stimulus. That's just the thing that gets the reflex to happen, pulls it out of you. So if you touch something hot and you pull your arm away, the eliciting stimulus is the hot surface. The pull your arm back is the reflex. Now look in chapter 3, it talks about the reflex arc, and that's just the physical part of it, right? That's your sensory neurons detect the hot surface. Um, that information travels through the sensory neurons to interneurons, or just the links in the chain, until you get to the motor neuron, where that causes your muscle to retract. Now pulling your arm away is a very simple reflex. Um, so it has a short chain. In fact, it only needs to travel into sensory, uh, up the sensory neuron, inner neurons, gets to spinal cord, whips around, and that's enough to cause the motor neuron to get your muscle to contract. So you don't really have to think about it. That information doesn't need to travel up to brain to get you to move. Now reflexes are very, they're hardwired. You're born with them. Your body's built to do these things. You don't have to learn them. They happen the first time. And that's how you can recognize a reflex is it's a behavior that will happen the first time that that eliciting stimulus is presented. Now the information does go up to brain. So if I have hot, you know, I touch hot and I sense that, my reflex may have me, you know, I may automatically pull my hand away if it's really hot, but on the other hand, the information does go up spinal cord to brain, so I can override certain reflexes. Like if I pick up a hot dish and it's grandmother's china, and I'll be like, hot, 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 but my brain is telling me don't drop it, and I get all the way to the counter before I put it down and go, ah, oh, that hurt. Now if it's really hot, I don't usually get that choice. And you can see how this is a survival thing. If you touch something painful, your body wants to get away from it. Now reflexes you'll see across animal species, pretty much anything, even an amoeba, will uh, pull away from some kind of aversive stimulus. So those are some words you want to know. Now some reflexes are actually more complex. They might be chains of behavior that take place. And we call these fixed action patterns. Now these are also hardwired. Um, but there's some things about fixed action patterns. First, I want to point out that any biologist uh, doesn't use the term fixed action pattern anymore. They usually call them modal action patterns. Now, if you remember from uh, research design or stats, mean, median, and mode, the mode modal score is the most frequent score. So by modal action pattern, they mean that the behavior typically looks like that, usually looks like that, but there might be slight differences. Now, fixed action pattern, again, is a chain of behaviors that is um, species typical. So that means just this species uh, does it. You don't see it in a wide range of species. So one example might be like the um, egg retrieval behavior of a goose. Now, there's a link so you can see a video of a goose doing this, where if you take an egg out of its nest, it'll take its beak and pull it back into the nest. And one thing in that video, what you'll see is a researcher removing the egg after the goose has started retrieving it and the goose continues to kind of use its beak as if the egg's there. And that's really common in a fixed action pattern. You're going to see once the chain of behavior starts, it goes to completion. So there's another example of there's a, this cocoon spinning spider where it has a fixed action pattern of spinning a cocoon to lay its eggs. So it spins the walls and it goes down and it spins this little cone goes up, lays its eggs, spins the top, and it's done. Now if you mess with the spider during any part of that, it will still go to completion. So if the spider's spinning this thing and gets the little cone and goes up to the top, and a researcher comes and clips off the bottom of it, the spider is going to just continue. It'll lay its eggs, it'll fall through, it'll spin the top, and it'll be done. Or you can disable the, um, the silk thing in the spider, and it will still go round and round and round and round as if it's spinning, go up, lay its eggs, they just fall and pretend to spin a top and it'll be done. So that's the thing. These are very hardwired um, behavior chains and once they start, they just go to completion. Um, if you have a dog, you might see him, you know, kind of go round and round and round before he lays down. 
and that is another fixed action pattern. It kind of has to do with almost like a nest building thing. If a dog was out in the wild and somewhere grassy, maybe it would do this. Um, it was pretty funny. We had a beanbag chair our dog used to um, sleep in and to watch the darn thing go round and round and round and trying to get the beanbag just right, you know, finally it'd lay down. That's another example. Cats don't do that. They do kind of make nests, but, you know, horses don't do that. So when you see things that only a particular species does, that's when you kind of gives you a clue that it's a fixed action pattern. Now, sign stimuli um, are the things that, the stimulus that gets the fixed action pattern to, to begin. Um, so let's see, for example, you know, the egg is the sign stimulus for the retrieval behavior. Um, now, super sign stimulus is something that you wouldn't see in nature. This is something that is even better than the normal stimulus and gets an even bigger reaction from an animal. And this, they came up with this when they were playing around with the egg retrieval behavior and thinking like, okay, so what exactly is the stimulus that elicits this behavior? And so with the goose, they were looking at, they played around with the eggs. So they made these wood models and they had small, medium, large eggs, they had different colors, they had speckled or not speckled. And let's see if I'm remembering this right, check the PowerPoint. But they found that the egg retrieval behavior that was the strongest, the most vigorous, was like a medium blue speckled egg. And what was really weird is for the species that they were studying, their eggs were small and brown. Um, and so what the researchers had developed is a sign stimulus that was even better than the natural stimulus. Now think about our research method or our data collection techniques. How could I measure the strength of a goose retrieving an egg, that behavior? How can I measure it? Perhaps a latency, maybe a duration, something like that. So kind of think about those data collection techniques in that. Also, uh, here's a little quiz for you. Um, think about what humans might do to change themselves to make them bigger and better than nature. What kind of super science stimuli do we do? Um, that it gets an enhanced response from someone. I'll tell you the answer in class with my favorite, most hilarious one. Think cosmetic surgery. Okay, so between a reflex and a fixed action pattern, reflexes are very simple, and you'll see them in a wide variety of species, like, you know, re pulling your hand back from something hot. Fixed action pattern, it's only certain species do these particular behaviors. You know, cats don't spin cocoons like the spider does. Dogs don't retrieve eggs, okay, um, and they're more complex chains of behavior. Now, reflexes don't happen exactly the same way every time you present a stimulus. They can change, and this, you know, some people consider these small changes learning or not, but here's the most simple way that reflexes can be modified or changed. The first one is by habituation, and that means if you have a a sign stimulus or just a stimulus that would elicit a reflex and you keep presenting that stimulus. So let's say we often have an orienting stimulus. So if you're sitting in class and it's class is going on and somebody walks in late, most of the class will do, like look over toward the door. We hear noise, we look over. Now if you think about it, that's a great survival skill because when there's new noises in the environment or new stimuli, you should pay attention to kind of figure out, okay, is that a bear? You know, you want to know that. That's important. The people that don't notice new things in their environment, again, probably didn't last long or have many children and they are not our ancestors. It's people that paid attention that actually survived, had kids, and here we are, and we're all the kinds of people who like to pay attention to new things. Okay, so this is good. But you don't want to pay attention to the same thing over and over, right? People keep walking in the door um, over and over. Eventually, that's really not important. You should ignore it. So it's good that with uh, repeated presentations of a stimulus, you might want to stop responding, just kind of decrease your responding. So typical things we habituate to are just noises that are in our environment that don't mean much, air conditioners, you kind of start ignoring them. If you're somebody who lives near a train track, when you first live there, you're going to notice every darn train that comes by, right, or traffic. But after a while, you're gonna see, it's almost as if you don't hear it anymore. You just stop paying attention. That would be habituation. And this is good too, because we want to be able to ignore irrelevant stimuli. We don't have a whole lot of attention we can give to the world. 
So we want to use it wisely and we want to, you know, look at new things, pay attention to new things, but eventually we want to stop using our limited resources on stuff that's not so important. So that's a great thing to have. Now sometimes, instead of decreasing our response to something that's repeated or repeatedly presented, we actually increase our response. And this would be sensitization. Now, some kind of silly examples might be um, if it's, think of if you're watching a scary movie and you're kind of like, mm, this, and you hear little noises in your kitchen or in your house or outside and you're like, oh, yeah. you know, you're getting, you're giving a bigger response than you would normally give because you're sensitized. Now, this is also can have survival value because um, an increase in response is good if there's something that might be threatening, okay? So, you know, if we're nervous and scared and it's late at night and it's dark and we're like, oh, this is good. You don't necessarily want to ignore things if you think you're in danger. But usually in the middle of the afternoon when we hear that same thing, we're like, eh, whatever, we'll habituate. Um, have you ever gone camping and you get one mosquito bite and or you hear a mosquito and then every little thing that touches you, you're like, oh, I don't get bit, you know? That would be an example of sensitization. You have a bigger than normal response to the same stimulus over and over. Okay, again, sensitization is kind of like, it, almost like a fight or flight thing. It gets you a little bit extra reactive, and that can be good if you need to be quick to respond to a threat, okay? So this also has survival value. Now, whether or not we habituate or sensitize to something, will usually have to do with the intensity or the significance of the stimulus, you know? So again, if we feel like we're in a sort of dangerous situation, we might more likely become sensitized. So if I'm walking home late at night in Fort Sanders, you know, and, and I see somebody in the alley, I'm going to be pretty sensitized and every little thing's going to make me jumpy. Where in the middle of the afternoon, you know, whatever, I don't care, I don't feel threatened, right? Or intensity, like loud noises, might make us jumpy. Um, one thing I hate is when people come up behind you and they go, boo, you know. I hate that when people do that because it gets me sensitized. It gets like the cortisol going and I'm just like, ugh. And then the thing about sensitization is once you're kind of sensitized, you'll react to all sorts of things in a bigger way. So sensitization increases response to all stimuli. So if somebody's just booed me and I'm all, ah, you know, and someone comes up, I'll be like, what? What do you want? You know, and it just drives me nuts. I'm all reactive to everything. Now, habituation on the other way is specific to the stimulus that's repeated over and over. So I might stop listening to the train going by my apartment, but I still notice if somebody opens the door. So it's not like I decrease response to all sorts of sounds. It's just that one particular sound or things that are really close to that sound. So if I've habituated to trains going by, and a big truck rumbles by my apartment, eh, you know, I may not notice that either. That would be a generalization. If things are similar to what I've habituated to, maybe I won't respond to them either. But it doesn't cut me off from responding to any other sorts of stimuli. So that's something that's different between these two. Okay. Now once a response is habituated, it can come back in a couple of ways. Um, the first way, let's say... Um, You've habituated to uh, somebody, you know, noises in the classroom while you're taking an exam. Let's say you sit down, and at first you kind of notice all this noise around you, but then you just sort of stop paying attention to the noise. Well, that your attention may come back, your habituated response may come back with the presentation of a new stimulus. So let's say you're not really paying attention to some of the noise in the room. You're taking your exam, and then I make a announcement like, oh, there's a typo on number 15. Okay. And you hear that and then it goes back and all of a sudden now you're again noticing little noises in the room that you had habituated to. Okay. So that would be dishabituation, sort of the undoing of habituation. Now, another process that brings back a habituated response is spontaneous recovery. That's the same thing in that your response is habituated but then there's this break in time where the stimulus isn't around and the stimulus is then presented again and you, you again notice it. So an example might be if you're um, working in a room and, sorry, hang on, and you're not responding to like the sound of your air conditioner and then the air conditioner goes off, which you don't even notice, and maybe 10 minutes goes by. 
and then it comes back on again and you start noticing it again. So just simply that break in time will get your response back. So keep in mind these two things are the same thing in that a, habituated, a response habituates and it comes back, but one is because of a new stimulus, just habituation, one is a break in time. So you'll have to be able to recognize those examples. Okay, so with that, you guys have an assignment now. And I want you to just take out a sheet of paper, it doesn't matter, any kind. Make it a full sheet though, put your name on it. And one, two, three, four, five. Number one through six, I'm gonna give you some examples and I want you to pick which one fits that example. Okay, so let's see. Um, let's say, hang on, I'm gonna take a break. 